Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve burst balloons and this problem has really earned that category of being a hard problem. So this is going to be another dynamic programming problem and we're going to solve it with the optimal solution which is going to be big O of n cubed time complexity and I believe big O of n squared memory complexity. And I'm gonna try my best to explain the intuition of this problem and kind of walk through my thought process. But if your question is, if you saw this problem for the first time in an interview, how would you be able to solve it? That's a good question. And honestly, I don't have the answer to that unless your interviewer gave you a couple of hints that kind of pointed you in the right direction because it, this problem requires a couple tricks to get it to work efficiently. So the description is pretty simple. We're given n balloons indexed from position zero to position n minus one. Each balloon is painted with a particular number on it. So basically we're given an input array of nums or uh, other words, balloons, and we're asked to burst all of the balloons. Now, when we burst a particular balloon I, we are gonna add to the total we're basically gonna get a total number of coins from popping that balloon. We're gonna, the total that we're gonna get is basically the number that was painted on that balloon multiplied by the two adjacent balloons to that balloon at that particular time. And of course, we might have a balloon that's on the boundary or on the edge of our input array. So if that's the case, for example, if I minus one or I plus one are out of bounds of the input array, then we're basically going to assume that there's, you know, a couple balloons with one painted on them on the edge. Basically, there's going to be some implicit ones. So, if, for example, if this is our input array, we're assuming there's a one over here and there's a one over here. The reason why is let's say we were given an input array of one number. Let's say that value was five, right? If we pop this, we're going to assume that there's ones on the edge, right? So, if we pop five, what are we going to get? We're going to get five times the right neighbor, which is one, times the left neighbor, which is one, right? So, basically, these are just neutral values. So, the total number of coins we're going to get from a single balloon is just going to be that value right five that makes sense that's why we're doing this so in this example the total number of maximum coins we can get is 167 and that is if we first pop this one value and then we get three times one times five because three and five are the neighbors since we pop that next what we're going to pop is the five now since we're popping this five well we need to get its neighbors right its right neighbor is obviously eight since we popped this one it's its left neighbor now is going to be the three that's over here so we're going to do three times five times eight so after we pop the five we now have two remaining we're going to pop the three first, and that's gonna give us three times eight. And the left neighbor, of course, remember we talked about at the beginning is implied to be a one. So then we're gonna get one times three times eight. Now the three has been popped. Last one left is just the eight, right? So the neighbors of that implicitly are just one and one. So eight times one times one, we add that up to our total, we get 167. Now these implicit extra ones on our input array, for example, those are not actually gonna be popped, right? So we need to remember that because obviously if we did pop them, right, we pop a one, we'd add one to our total. And if we pop the other one, we'll add another one, but that's not actually gonna be the case, right? We don't wanna pop these extras. So even if you can't get the dynamic programming solution, at the very least, we know that there's a brute force approach, right? We could choose to pop three first, we could choose to pop one first, we could choose to pop five, we could choose to pop eight, right? And then we could continue down this decision tree, right? That's the brute force, right? Something like a backtracking approach. But in that case, obviously we have n choices roughly at each layer and the height of the tree is gonna be n. So basically the time complexity is gonna be something like n to the power of n. Now that's not super efficient. And in this case, we actually can do better, but it's not easy to arrive to that solution. So now let me explain a little bit of the thought process to get us there. And then I'm gonna jump into the code. In this case, the code is actually not too bad once you see the couple of tricks that we need in this problem. So we know the brute force approach, but can we identify any sub problems? Your first idea might be something like this. Okay, so let's say I pop the fifth element, right? We pop this balloon. Now we have a new sub problem, right? We have this entire array minus this value as the sub problem, right? Or for example, maybe I popped one. Now we would get this entire array except the one as a sub problem, right? Now, if I continue popping, for example, I pop one, next I pop eight. Now we have a different sub problem. So 
if I keep going like this, how many sub problems are we going to have? Well, basically what we're doing as we pop elements, we're basically getting every single subsequence, right? Now, how many subsequences for an input array are there? Well, for each value, we could choose to include it or not include it, right? So for each value, we have two choices, two times two times two, right? We're basically going to do this for the size of the input array, which is let's say n. So we're going to have two to the power of n subsequences. So basically what I'm getting at here is this is not the correct sub problem that we're looking for. We need to look for an even more simple sub problem because if we have this many sub problems, that's not going to help us. Caching something like this is not going to make the, the solution more efficient. We want to get something like n cubed, n squared, etc. right? This is what I'm aiming for. Let's try to see if we can get it. So let's say I pop the five. Now, is there an even more simple sub problem? Well, we notice now we actually have two sub arrays, right? We have one sub array over here and one sub array over here. Now these sub arrays are contiguous. They're not sub sequences. That's pretty good because we know that at most for an input array of size n, there could be at most, there could be at most n squared sub array. So that's something we can work with to make an efficient solution. So now you might think, well, can I take each of these subarrays, right? Basically by popping this, we got something like one times five times eight. Now we wanna know independently what the, each of these subarrays could get us, like how many maximum coins could this subarray and this subarray get us, right, independently. But what we're gonna notice is we can't just look at this subarray independently, right? Because independently, a three times one, right? The max we could get is we first pop the one, right? In that case, we get one times three and you know the right neighbor is nothing. So once we pop that and then we pop this three, right? Then we'll get three times, basically just three by itself, right? So we pop this, then we add the second balloon that we pop. So we'd get a total of six, right? Just independently if we had this subarray three and one. But we know that in reality, this three and one is now gonna be connected to this eight, right? And independently, what this eight would get us is eight by itself, right? Because it doesn't have any neighbors. So in total, if we took a look at both of these independently, we'd get something like six plus eight. So in total, 14, right? But in reality, when we look at three, one, eight, what's the max we could possibly get in this case? Well, we'd pop the one first, right? Then we'd get three times one, times eight. Now that's 24. That already by itself went over the total that we would get if we did these independently. So basically what I'm getting at is we can't break the problem up like this, right? We can't look at these arrays separately because in reality, we know that they're going to be connected to each other. Okay, so that's not gonna work. Now, this is the part where you have to be kind of clever. We said, what happens if we pop this one first and then try to do the remaining array? Let's reverse our thinking. Instead of popping this first, let's say we pop this value last. So what happens if we pop this value last? Meaning we pop this entire subarray and before, right, before we pop this, and we pop this entire subarray before we pop this. What's gonna happen then? Well, we know if this is the last value that we pop, meaning we popped everything here, we popped everything here, it's left and right neighbors are both gonna be one, right? There's gonna be a one over here, and there's gonna be a one over here. So we're gonna get one times five times one. But what's the remaining amount that we get from popping these two subarrays now? Because in this case, since we're popping this value last, that means these two subarrays are never going to be connected to each other ever, not at any point, because this is being popped last. So since these two subarrays are not going to be connected, that means we can now pop them independently. So let's take a look now. Let's pop this 3-1 independently. What's going to happen? Well, we remember when we pop this independently, we're basically gonna get one times three plus three, right? That, that's gonna total up to six once again, right? But that's not actually what we're looking for because remember, this subarray is not independent. We are, it's true, we're gonna pop this before we pop the five, but we can't just forget about the five, right? There is a five right next to this three one. So in reality, when I pop the one, I'm gonna get three times one times five. And then when I pop the three, because we know we're not gonna pop, we're popping this last, right so we are popping these two first but then when I pop the three I'm gonna get one times three times five right because there's an implicit one over here so how can I handle that what I'm saying is our, our array hasn't actually changed there is the five still over here 
but we want to pop all of these elements before we pop this five. How can I handle that? Well, it's actually not too different than what we went over at the beginning. Remember we said that, let's say we had a single element in our input array, let's say it's a three, right? We're assuming even for this input array, there's gonna be an implicit one on the left and there's gonna be an implicit one on the right. These two values are not gonna be popped when we're popping this array, but we're still assuming that they're there for that computation that we're gonna be doing. That's exactly the same rule that we're gonna follow. So. When, when we go from up here to down here, right, this is our sub problem. So we, we have we have identified what the sub problem is going to be. It's going to be this sub array. The only thing we have to remember is just like at the beginning, how there's going to be an implicit one on the left. Now there's going to be an implicit five on the right. So for the sub array that we're doing, the left boundary is going to be at this value. The right boundary is going to be at this value, but these values are not going to go away. We are going to leave this in the input array and we are going to make sure that we have an implicit one at the beginning of the input array. And similarly, when we want to solve this subarray, we are going to assume that, yeah, there's just a single eight, right? So the left boundary is going to be here as well as the right boundary. Both boundaries are going to be here, but we're going to assume that there's an implicit one at the right. And this five is not going away. The five is going to be here as well. We're not going to pop it because take a look at our boundary. Our boundary tells us just to pop this subarray before we end up doing anything else. So this is going to stay here. We're not going to pop it, but it is going to contribute to the, the total number of coins. For example, when we pop eight, we're going to get five times eight times one. That's going to be the total number of coins we get once we pop this entire subarray. So using subarrays, using this technique where for every value, we're going to identify, well, what if we popped this value last? That allows us to actually get a sub problem that we can cache. Now in our cache, it's going to be, let's say we call it DP. This is our cache. It's going to be a two dimensional cache because we are going to be using the left value as the first index and the right value as the second index. These left and right values are basically just going to tell us what the subarray is from the original array, right? Left is going to be the left boundary, R is going to be the right boundary. With that being said, let me just give you a quick high level run through of the algorithm and then we're going to dive into the code. So we remember in the brute force, we started out with, okay, what happens if we pop this first? What happens if we pop this first, right? So that's going to give us a decision tree. Now we're going to do it a little bit differently. Our decision tree now is going to be what happens if we pop this last? What happens if we pop this last? What happens if we pop this last? Which one of those paths is gonna lead us to the maximum number of coins, right? So we are still gonna brute force it, kind of. We are gonna have that exact same decision tree. Only thing is we're gonna use a cache. We're gonna take that sub problem and cache them. So for example, let's say we pop this value last. What am I gonna do? And we actually are gonna modify the input array. So we are gonna add that implicit one at the beginning and at the end, but our boundary is gonna be, left is gonna be from here and right is gonna be from here. That's ultimately, these are the values that we're actually gonna be popping. We're not actually gonna be popping these. Again, the brute force, what happens if we pop this last? If we pop this last, our left subarray becomes empty, right? There's nothing there in the left subarray but our right subarray is gonna have this entire portion, right? So since currently our boundary, our left boundary is here and our right boundary is here, if we pop this value last, this is what our total is gonna be. We're gonna get, so if we pop this last, we know it's gonna, we're gonna end up popping everything here before that, right? So when we pop this value, we're gonna get three times one times one, right? So what I'm gonna say is three times nums of right, which is over here, plus one, and nums of left, which is over here, minus one. That's gonna give us, one, once we pop this, plus we want the remaining number of coins that we get from popping the remaining portion of the left subarray. We see that there's nothing here, right? Remember, we're not actually popping this value. There's no other values in between, so there is no left subarray. What about the right subarray? We're gonna take our left pointer, shift it by one. That's gonna put left over here. So the right subarray is gonna be all of these elements, right? So you can see we're gonna get that total amount computed from our DP, right? We're going to get it from our DP if that's already been computed as a sub problem. If it hasn't been computed, then we're just going to do that brute force depth first search, passing in these same parameters, right? L plus one and right. Now let's look at it for a more general case. If we were popping, let's say a middle value as the last value where we actually do have both a left subarray and a right subarray, what's the equation going to look like then? 
So we were looking at if we popped this value last. Next, we're gonna look at if we pop this value last. We're also then gonna look at this and this, right? That's basically the brute force, right? So basically we're gonna have an I, right? It's gonna start here and it's gonna run all the way through the end of the input array. But now if we pop this last, we know that if, if this was popped last, we'd end up popping all of this first and we'd pop this first. So then once we popped this, it's left would be the one, it's right would be the one, right? So that's where we're getting this from, right? R plus one's here left minus one is over here, multiplied by the value at index i, which is one, right? But then what's our right subarray going to be? Clearly, this is what the right subarray, remaining subarray is, right? How, how much could we get from doing that? Well, again, in our DP, or if it's not already computed in our DP, we're basically gonna call our depth first search. Clearly, you can see that the left boundary now is i plus one, right? Basically, we're taking this i, moving it over here. Our right boundary remains unchanged, right? This is the subarray. That's what I'm saying here. What about our left subarray over here? Well, the left boundary didn't change, but the right boundary was decremented by one. That makes sense, right? So that's basically the idea. Now, my question is, we know why the memory complexity is big O of n squared, right? The cache is basically going to be from every single subarray, right? and it's two dimensional, so that makes sense. I think why it's, the memory is n squared, but why is the time complexity big O n cubed? Well, we know we're gonna be breaking this problem down into subproblems of every single subarray. We know that there's n squared number of subarrays, right? So for once we have a subarray, right? Like let's consider the entire input array was a subarray, right? We know that for every subarray, we're basically gonna be iterating through every value, right? This is the first, this is the second, this is the, and so on and so on, right? And considering if this was the last value popped. So it's basically taking the total number of subarrays, which we know is n squared, and multiplying it by another n because we're having to iterate through every single value for a given subarray. With that being said, let's jump into the code. Once you actually know these tricks, and especially once you know this formula, the algorithm is actually pretty easy with recursion. So like I mentioned, we are gonna be updating the input array. We're basically gonna be adding a one at the beginning and then adding a one at the end. We're also gonna be having a cache. I'm gonna call it DP because it's short. And then we can start with our depth first search function. So let's define it. We know that we're just gonna have left and right boundaries, right? So basically left and right are gonna be indices of the input array, but let's call that depth first search function. We know we're just gonna be end up calling it and then returning the results. So let's do that before we actually define the function. Now, what am I gonna pass in as a left and right boundary zero and you know, the last index? No, right? Because we don't want to actually include this one and we don't want to include this one. So I'm going to be passing in zero plus one, which is one, and basically passing in the length of the entire input array nums minus two, because we know this minus one would give us the last value minus two is going to be one less than that. So because remember, we're not actually popping these and these. Okay, so now what are actually the base cases for this algorithm? Well, if left equaled right, that means we have only one balloon left to pop. So that's actually okay. But if left passed the right pointer, so if left became greater than right, that's when we know we've ran out. And that's when we know we're going to we're gonna return zero, meaning there's nothing left to pop. Otherwise, maybe we've already computed this before and it's already in our cache, right? This left and right pair is already in DP. In that case, we're just going to return DP of left and right. Otherwise, we know that it hasn't been computed, so now it's our time to actually compute it. So let's set it initially to zero, and now we're gonna determine what is the max number of coins we could get for this pair. So remember, we're gonna be iterating through every i, considering if at index i, that balloon was the last balloon we popped. So let's go through every index from left all the way to right, and let's compute the number of coins we could get from that. So we know that if this nums of i was popped last, we'd get nums of i multiplied by nums of right plus one multiplied by nums of left minus one, right? And now to coins, we're gonna add the additional coins that we would get from the left and right subarrays, right? So we're gonna be calling our depth first search function. The left boundary stays the same and we're gonna do I minus one. And we're also gonna be calling it for the right subarray, which we know we can get with I plus one as a left boundary and our right boundary is gonna stay the same. So now we've computed the total number of coins, right? It makes sense why we're doing this. 
and then calling our depth for search function. So now we can potentially update the result, which we know we're storing here in DP of left and right. So we're gonna update it to the max of potentially what it already is and the max of what we just computed, the total number of coins that we just computed. And so we're basically gonna be running through the entire loop doing that. I hope that this kind of makes it a little more obvious of why this is n cubed. We know that this depth for search function, the maximum possible number of ways it could be called is n squared, right? Every pair of the left and right indices could be n squared times. E, and then if we actually, if it's already been cached, then we're gonna return it in big O of one time. If it hasn't been cached, meaning it's the first time we're computing this, we're gonna have to run through a linear time loop. And for each of these pairs, we are gonna have to run through a loop at least once. So that's what's gonna give us the n cubed time complexity. But yeah, once this has been computed, we know, you know, we can just go ahead and return it from this recursive function. And that is the entire thing. So, you know, we defined a function inside of a function, but once you know, you know, the trick, which is not so obvious, we do have to do this. And then we do have that relationship of, you know, we're popping this, this balloon last. It's not super intuitive, but once you do have it, hopefully your interviewer gives you that hint. But, and if you do get that, the code is actually not too bad as you can see when you do recursion. So I hope that this was helpful. If it was, please like and subscribe. It supports the channel a lot and I'll hopefully see you pretty soon. Thanks for watching.